Well, it's good to be with you on this Palm Sunday at the start of Holy Week, and we look forward to being with you next Sunday on Easter. And like Scott said, be thinking about and praying about who will you bring with you next Sunday morning. It's going to be an exciting day. All right, open your Bibles to John chapter 12. We started several weeks ago going through just a brief look at the book of John leading up to Easter. We're looking at Jesus' words on life. We talked first about him talking about new life as he speaks to Nicodemus. Last week we talked about abundant life. And this week I want to talk about kingdom life. What do those words mean? As Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven on earth, what are the implications for you and me? What does that mean to, to us now? What did he mean when he said those words? So here's what he says in John chapter, or here's what we read happens in John chapter 12. So it's Passover. The next day, the great, a great ca- crowd had come for the festival and heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. And so this is the scene. We have the Passover starting, and Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and people just like the kids all around us have palm branches, and they're waving. Except this king is not coming on a stallion, an Arabian stallion. He's coming on a donkey, like Isaiah said. And so they're expecting a king. They're calling him king. The words in the Bible speak of a coming king. But what kind of kingdom did Jesus come to establish? What did, what did he mean when he spoke of his kingdom? I want to start with our understanding by talking about two misconceptions, I'll call them, when it comes to the kingdom of God. The first one that I have is, we'll call this the ancient Jewish misconception. So when you read John chapter 12, you can't help but see that all of the people were expecting a political kingdom. They wanted a military kingdom. They wanted, wanted a Jewish Zionist kingdom. They wanted to be rid of the Romans. You see, Jesus, when he arrived, Romans ruled everything. They had all the power, all the wealth, and, and the Jews had nothing. And, and, the, and they were being oppressed by the Romans. And then you had this young rabbi come along, and he says, I'm bringing a new kingdom. And he starts inviting in the least and the desperate, and the divorced. And he said, you will sit at the top of my kingdom. And this got people real excited and fired up because they wanted a military political kingdom. But that was a misconception. The Jewish people are still waiting for this king and this kingdom to come. Well, the second misconception that I have in your notes and on the screen is what I'll term the the modern Christian misconception. This is the idea that the kingdom of God, and and this is maybe for the past hundred years, this is how the kingdom of God has been talked about, at least in our country, is that it happens in our minds. It's something that happens in our soul. It's internal and personal. That's true, but it's not the complete story. Uh, This second misconception of the, the, I would also say, is it's seen as a kingdom for after you die. And which is true. I believe heaven is for real, and it really is a place we'll go. But the, the, the modern Christian mis, uh, misconception is that it doesn't have much to do with life right now. It's for after we die. And so that's how I understood the kingdom and heard about the kingdom for many years. And um, But then a few years ago, a good friend of mine, Matt Hammett, invited me to a retreat he was having for pastors around the country. And he said, and the invitation was, come for a weekend of kingdom dreaming. Now, he said, I wasn't even sure what he meant by his email, but the invitation was to a beach house in Laguna. So I went for that. It was summer here, so I went for that. And he had invited pastors from Florida and from Washington and from California. And, and I joined them. And we spent the whole weekend talking about how this world could be changed if churches and pastors pulled their best thinking and their best resources and the kingdom of God spread on earth. What would that look like? Well, all I did was take it in and soak it up like a sponge because I had never heard the kingdom of God talked about in such tangible terms. And so over the course of the next year, I read 
just about everything I could get my hands on about the kingdom of God because, because I realized I was like many Christians in most churches is we don't talk about the kingdom of God as something that's tangible. So I read Scott McKnight's One Life. I read Dallas Willard's Divine Conspiracy. I read N.T. Wright in his words on the kingdom. And all of a sudden I realized that so many of us miss what Jesus meant when he talked about the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. So I, I write about my, kind of my eyes being opened. I write an extended allegory in the opening chapters of Barefoot Tribe. I have a chapter dedicated to the kingdom of God. Let me read to you just kind of my journey and what it was like. And, and listen as I read one page here, page and a half. Um, so this actually happened. It's, it's an allegory, but this actually happened to me. So I had gone to Sky Harbor, I hurried up to the U.S. Airways kiosk just outside of security to print my boarding pass. After I swiped my credit card for ID, the screen asked, would you like an upgrade? You bet I would. I punched the yes button. As I grabbed my boarding pass, I did a double take. I was in seat 3D, first class, jackpot. I had a hard time believing it was true. So after being groped by security at TSA, I, uh, that, that's what happened. And I stopped at the first U.S. Airways desk I came upon. Could you look at my boarding pass? The machine just printed me a first-class ticket. Do you think it billed my credit card? The agent looked at my boarding pass, then said with a warm smile, No, honey, you've been upgraded. You're darn right. Uh, when, I, when I settled into my first-class seat, I still felt there had to be a mistake. This had never happened to me before. Then just when I started to sip on my ice-cold drink and a crystal goblet, someone blurted, you're in my seat. What? I knew it. I pulled out my boarding pass to protest, being relegated to coach. Look, it says right here, I'm in 3D, pointing to the other seats. I explained, A, B, C, D. C, I'm in D. Uh, there's no C in first class, she snapped snarkily. Uh, there's a, you're in 3E, e, not D. Uh, close call. I was still in first class. She made me move seats, by the way. Uh, not long after her takeoff, I smelled something. Now, I've spent thousands of hours in coach, and there's a smell in there too, kind of like a junior high locker room smell. Uh, this was different. It was ravishing. It was raviolis with fruit and cheese on china. As the flight attendant set my gourmet Italian dinner in front of me, I whispered, you're an angel. You have no idea how much better this looks than the PB&J I have in my backpack. And I wasn't kidding. Side note here, when they close the curtains and people in coach can smell what you're eating, they start coming up and trying to part the iron curtain and use the banos. And I just was, no, no, back. <laughs> dirt bags, dirt bags. And so... After a few minutes, she brought dessert, red velvet cake topped with whipped cream and chocolate flakes floating on a bed of fudge. It was a glorious flight. As I reflected on my kingdom discovery journey, I realized I've spent years in Christian coach. When I could have been in first class, there's a whole world out there I never understood, never experienced, never entered into. And so I write this book for all of us who have missed the kingdom, I invite you to come inhale it, absorb it, soak it in. It's not too late. The kingdom of God waits for you. And so that's where I want to take us this morning. Maybe you have never thought much about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven coming to earth and what the implications are for your life. But there are dramatic implications for your life. So I mentioned Scott McKnight. He's a theologian and New Testament professor at... North Park College in Chicago, and he's written a book titled um, Kingdom Conspiracy. And in it, he makes, he writes about two analogies. He says there's two modern views of the kingdom of heaven. The first he calls the pleated pants perception of the kingdom. So we have a picture here, the pleated pants. And he said, pleated pants people, when they talk about the kingdom of God, they talk about it being internal, something that is private. We use 
personal savior kind of language. Now, this is true, but this doesn't paint the whole picture. Yes, it's inside, but the way I always understood the kingdom of God before is that it was so ethereal, you could never put your hands on it. And then this perception of kingdom is that it's also, it's for another time, for another realm after you die. That's the pleated pants perception, he calls it. And then he writes about the skinny jeans perception of the kingdom of heaven. And he says, skinny jeans people, when they talk about the kingdom of God, they say, it's all around you. It's not just inside of you, but it's all around you in everything you do. And it's not just for another realm and for another life. After you die, the kingdom of God starts now. So when I read, when I, when I think about what Scott McKnight is saying, I see very good biblical veracity in both perspectives, and so this morning, I want to say, yes, it's a both and. And so we, we put a pair of pants. There you go. We put that together. You put this on eBay. You're going to be rich if you start selling these. And uh, it's a both and. It's, it's a bit of a mystery and a paradox how it all comes together. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, it wasn't just something that we thought about cognitively. It's something that we actually tangibly lived in, and we did. And so that's why I say it's both, and it's and. As Westerners, we don't love mystery and paradox, but you have to accept it when we start talking about the kingdom of heaven on earth. So the critical thing question we should all be asking is, so what is Jesus's idea of kingdom? And so I want to spend the rest of our morning talking about what Jesus meant when he talked about the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, For example, some say that of all Jesus's teaching, his most central, most critical teachings were around the kingdom of God. And when we understand them, they have huge implications for how we live right now. And so What did Jesus, let's go back to where we started. What did Jesus mean when he said kingdom of God? What did his listeners understand when he used that language? And then what does it mean for you and me to to talk about this and to live it out? Now, when you read the synoptic gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, they are very similar. They're the same. Uh, Luke and Mark used the language kingdom of God. But Matthew, who's writing primarily to a Jewish audience, and they don't write the word God, he says kingdom of heaven. But the terms are synonymous as we go through this. Go back a few pages in your Bible to Matthew chapter 10. And in Matthew, cha- I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. And in Matthew chapter 6, we are reading about Jesus, as we call it, his Sermon on the Mount. Some call it his kingdom manifesto, and I love that language. And he says this in verse 10. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What did he mean by that? Then later he says, he makes this intriguing statement, the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he says the kingdom of God is near. So let me establish what the scene was like when Jesus came along. So way back in Genesis, God had promised Abraham a land and a people. He says, you will have countless descendants, God promises in this. And he says, look around you, you'll have all of this land. But now, and then he says, you, you, as a nation in your land, you'll be a blessing to all the other nations. But now it's 37 B.C. By 37 B.C., the Jewish people had no land. The Romans had taken it all. And they're, they're asking God the question, how can we be a blessing to anybody if we have no land? How can we be a, a blessing if we're living under the oppression of the Roman Empire? And the Roman Empire had all the power, had all the influence. And, and then this rabbi comes along who is just a construction worker. He has no degrees. He has no army. He has no tanks or grenade launchers, and he says, I'm starting a new kingdom. And people weren't sure what to think of him, especially when he started to say, I'm not coming to the rich and to the powerful and to the politically connected, but he came to the peasants and to the urban poor and to the divorced and to the least and to the last. And he says, he starts using this subversive language and saying, all of you who are at the bottom of this world will sit 
at the top of my kingdom. And people got really excited about this, and they were ready to, to start a revolution. And that's why they're waving branches saying, our king is coming. When you think about Jesus' kind of kingdom, on one hand, it seems a bit of a mockery, doesn't it? Like, this is just a pipe dream because it's a kind of, it's a kind of revolution that poets and artists talk about in Che Guevara because he had no military and he had no, no grenades and guns, but he comes along with a different kind of kingdom. And on the other hand, maybe his kind of kingdom can actually change the world. And maybe we're the crazy ones to think that wars can bring peace or that gossip can bring friends back together or that discrimination brings unity or any of those things. And and here's the best part. When Jesus talks about his kingdom, he invites all of us in. All of us, he says, come in. I want you to turn forward a few pages in your Bible to John chapter 13. And I'm going to read this from the Message Bible. So, If we pick up the story after he comes into Jerusalem, they're waving the palm branches. That night in Bethany, he pulls his closest friends together, and they have a dinner. And then in the middle of this dinner, he he stands up dramatically, takes off his robe, and he starts to wash their feet. One of them, the stubborn one named Peter, he tries to resist, and he says, you can't be in my kingdom unless I wash your feet. And when he's done washing all of their feet, he says, I This is John 13, verse 14. I'm going to read from the Message Bible. I, the master and teacher, washed your feet. You must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. If you understand what I'm telling you, then act like it. And you will live the blessed life. So the question is, what is this pattern? In what ways must we act? How do we live this most blessed life that Jesus talks about? There's two phrases I want to use as we talk about Jesus' perception or idea of the kingdom of God. The first is, I'll say this, that the kingdom of God is now and not yet. So what does that mean? Again, we go back to kind of a mystery and a paradox, but the not yet part we get. Uh, The not yet part is talking about heaven. The not yet part is there's an eternity. And like I said, yes, heaven is real. And, And that's one of the great reasons we share the gospel message is because we are invited there after we die. But Jesus' kingdom ideas don't stop there. It's a now and a not yet. The kingdom of heaven starts now, which is a wild and interesting thought. But when Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, there was always a nowness to his message. It was not meant to just be something cognitive. It was not meant just for a time after we die. He says things like this, Matthew 6, 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 10, 7, as you go preach this message, the kingdom of God is near. The problem is, growing up, at least my experience in churches, the kingdom of God was always something so ethereal, something, just an idea for a heart that you could never wrap your hands around it. Let, let me try to explain it like this. So some of our pastors and I were at Cat, the Catalyst Conference a few years ago, and John Ortberg was interviewing Dallas Willard brilliant theologian. And John Orberg starts by saying, he's setting up a question. He said, he said, Dallas, when I was growing up, when I was young, my idea of the gospel was that the minimum entrance requirements to pass the exam to get into heaven. He said, that was my idea of the gospel. If I could just pass the minimum entrance requirements. And Dallas Willard said, that's no good. That's like taking the driver's test or the DMV, the written test, but never driving the car. And so Dallas Willard says this. Let me, I want to read it just so I don't get it wrong. He says, he says uh, the gospel as Jesus presented it is not just about getting into heaven after we die. He says the gospel as Jesus presented it is about getting into heaven before we die. That's just a crazy thought, but he's right. Because in the New Testament, we keep, it, we keep uh, being reminded that we have made this transition from the old life to the new life. That's why Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he tries to explain that you've left your old life behind and uh, you enter into that you have to be born again. And then in Luke we read this, 
This is Luke 6, 20. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is a kingdom of God. Let me turn there with me. And this is, again, going back to his kingdom manifesto. He says, Blessed are you who hunger, now you'll be satisfied. Blessed who you who, who weep, now you will laugh. And as we read this, and we, we hear the nowness of Jesus as he talks about his kingdom of heaven, I would ask you this question. Are the poor only blessed after they die? Are the hungry only fed after they die? Are those who are naked and need clothes only find clothes after they die? Do fathers and sons only reconcile and speak again after they die? Do marriages only heal after we die? Or do we take Jesus as, at his word when he says, uh, my kingdom comes now and all of his now language, and today we are to feed the hungry and make peace with our enemies. So I said, as we talk about Jesus' idea of kingdom, the kingdom of God is now and not yet. The next thing I'll say is the kingdom of God, and just two thoughts here, the kingdom of God is in, in and outside of your life. Again, it's a both... Of both and. Now, the inside part we get, we know that things need to change on the inside. And if you really understand the kingdom of God, you know that it starts with your soul. It just starts with change on the inside. Some of you right now are sitting here, and you know that on the inside there are some things that are not right. You know that on the inside some things must change. So, living in, in the kingdom of God, it starts there. Some of you right now on the inside, things are kind of messed up. Some of you here even now are struggling with addictions on the inside. Some of you on the inside, you're harboring bitterness. Some of you are hiding secrets. Some of you on the inside, you're hiding deception and lies. And you know that, but you think you can hide it on the inside. But the kingdom of God starts there, and it starts changing you there. The kingdom of God on the inside means that you become a person of more grace and more peace and more kindness first on the inside. I have a list here of kingdom words, we'll, we'll call them. And I have a list, kingdom words and non-kingdom words. How's that? So, let, I, just... You don't have to remember all of these. We'll go through them quick. But, for example, jealousy is a non-kingdom word, and some of us have that on the inside. Empathy is a kingdom word. Anger is a non-kingdom word. But, on the other hand, beauty is a kingdom word. Unforgiveness is not in the kingdom of God, but simplicity is. Uh, discrimination is a non-kingdom word. Love, loving all people is part of being in God's kingdom. Uh, bitterness is a non-kingdom word, but restore is a kingdom word. Another one, lima beans is a non-kingdom word. Just trying to bring clarity to our discussion here. And uh, the, the polar opposite of that, Cinnabons, would be a, you'll find that in the kingdom of heaven on earth and in heaven. And envy is a non-kingdom word. On the other hand, repair is a kingdom word. Deceit. Compassion, to show compassion is a kingdom word. Not, dispassion, on the other hand, is a non-kingdom word. Inclusion is a kingdom word. And then finally, exclusion is a non-kingdom word. And to be considerate of all people is a kingdom word. Do you see the dichotomy here, the great difference between and, and the changes that have to happen on the inside? And then I said the kingdom of God is something that happens on the inside, but it also affects our outside lives, the world around us. And that's what so many people have missed. Like I said, about 100 years ago, as Western Christians, we began to privatize our experience with God. And we talked about our personal Savior and having him in our heart. And those things are true, but to a degree, because if the kingdom of God is really ruling your life, then what's good for your life is good for your neighborhood, and it's good for your neighbor, and it's good for your community. The good news of God is not just certain religious activities that we do. It's a, it's a reorientation of how we live our lives every day. When I, when I say that, I, I think of Paul's ambassador language. So if we live in God's kingdom, I don't want you to miss that you become an emissary or an ambassador of Christ. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are Christ's ambassadors. And so in this kingdom of God, that's you. 
And to be honest, I've always wanted to be an ambassador. I always thought when I was in college, I could be an ambassador. I would even take the smallest countries, Tibet, it could be any, Tahiti, you know, Belize, any of them. Uh, you know, I, and, and any Mexico, New Mexico, Old Mexico, I would have been glad to take either. Even countries we're not sure are countries, like Canada. You know, I would have been glad to be an ambassador there. Is it a state or a country? We don't know. And, but I always thought that'd be an awesome position to be an ambassador. And, and, and the Bible uses that language about your life, that you are an emissary of the kingdom of heaven on earth, and God gives you spaces every day for you to influence. You have your neighborhood space. You have your workspace, and he wants you to go and represent him there. And being an ambassador not, is not just a matter of special religious activities, but it's something that we give our entire life to. Um, and being an ambassador, an emissary of God, means that we spread the beauty of knowing Jesus Christ everywhere we go. And that we represent the best things of him. We rep represent his grace and his goodness and his beauty and his generosity. But then also as an emissary of the kingdom of heaven, you're put here to stop the worst things from happening in this world. Sometimes it's you that God wants to use to stop the worst things around us. I, I had a moment in a kingdom. I was in a kingdom some of you have been to. It's called the Magic Kingdom. And I was there quite a few years ago with my family. And there's like 20 chinchins there. And I can still picture us like it was yesterday standing under this tree trying to get some shade we're all arguing about which ride we go on next in this magic kingdom. And they're all over-opinionated, all of them. And, and we can't, and then I hear a couple arguing just next to us. And, uh, but they're arguing in another language, and I'm not sure what they're saying. And then all of a sudden, I see this man reach out and slap this young woman across the face. And, you know, sometimes we think before we react. I didn't think. I just took two steps and I grabbed him from behind and put him in a chokehold. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. <laughs> but I grabbed him like, what are you doing? You can't hit her. And now my family notices. They all miss the slap. They just see me grab this guy from behind. And they're yelling, Palmer, let him go. Let him go. And I'm saying, it's fine. He'll be back in a few minutes. And I've got him in the chokehold. They're yelling at me. I'm going, no. And so I start speaking. I said, you can't slap her. And then he has the audacity to say this. He says, in my country, it's okay. And, and then I said, no, you can't, not here, not in this happiest place on earth, Magic Kingdom, you can't do that. And I said, not in this country, you can't. And finally, my family pried my arms away and they released him. But my, and I'm not saying, now that's a crazy, wacky example. But don't miss that every day around you, there are p things that you need to intervene in and stop the worst of things. Being an emissary in the kingdom of God means that in your workplace, if someone is being discriminated against, then it's you that speaks up. And in, in, in your circle of friends or in your neighborhood, if someone is being gossiped about and their reputation is being destroyed, then it's you that must speak up. You, make, you stop the worst things from happening in this kingdom, and you make the best things happen. I, you know, when, when you read or hear about the orphans in Haiti, then it needs to be you that responds to do something to stop the hunger. When you hear Matt Parker from Exodus Road talk about six-year-old girls being sold for sex in Thailand, then that's you that must stop that. That's part of our roles as ambassadors and embassies in the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of heaven is not just something that we think about and wait to live till we die. The kingdom of God starts now. The kingdom of God starts today. And in this kingdom, I've written down just a few thoughts. In this kingdom, it advances when people reconcile. In this kingdom, it grows when we love and accept people of all backgrounds and nationalities and immigration status. This kingdom comes when people become ridiculously generous. This kingdom spreads when people choose to show grace rather than anger. And this kingdom of heaven comes to earth when you love, when love becomes a dominant value of your life. So I think every once in a while, we get a glimpse 
of the kingdom of heaven coming to earth through your life. And sometimes in the most ordinary way, on the most ordinary day, you cause the kingdom of heaven to expand by the most simple thing that you do. When I say that, it makes me think of a moment Veronica and I had in Chicago years ago. We were celebrating our 10th anniversary, and so I booked a hotel room downtown Chicago. Uh, I took her on one of those boat rides out on the lake, and then I made reservations at a French restaurant because we had honeymooned in Paris. And so we get to dinner, but we have a two-and-a-half-year-old-month baby with us. And this baby wasn't having the, the same kind of en- enjoyable weekend we were. And so we sit down, we order, and, and this our two-and-a-half-year-old-month-old baby is just fussing, crying, crying. We're passing him back and forth, and the food's there, and we can't hardly eat because he's crying. And then a woman gets up, and I'm like, oh, no, she's going to complain. And she comes over and she says, can I hold your baby so you can eat? And we said, please, by all means. And (laughs) she did. And she took him. And she had raised a few kids, you could tell. And she just uh, starts rubbing his back and he gets really quiet. And so we're enjoying our meal. And then she walked out the door of the restaurant to give us some peace. And that's been about 19 years. I haven't seen her in a long time. But anyway, she came back in, and he's asleep, and she hands him to us. And I want to say that's the most simple thing, but when you stop a young couple from being embarrassed about their baby crying, and you give them a few moments of peace to celebrate their anniversary, then in my opinion, the kingdom of heaven just spread a little bit further on earth. I have this list here I want to share with you to close, and... It's just this. I'll say the kingdom of heaven uh, shines brighter. For example, if you have a coworker that can't figure out a project and you help them with it and they succeed and you let them take all the credit, then the kingdom of heaven just shined a little brighter. Uh, when you sit, sat down with a stranger who you saw had tears in their eyes, the kingdom of heaven shined brighter. Um, If you forgive a friend who's hurt you, really hurt you with their actions, then the kingdom of heaven just shine brighter. If you sit down with a friend whose marriage is crumbling and you share some wisdom and you help that marriage heal, then the kingdom of God just shined a little brighter. And if you take a couple's young infant and you walk it so they can enjoy a dinner together, the kingdom of heaven just expands just a little bit more. So my invitation to close is this. Jesus came and he says, live in my kingdom now and forever. That invitation is there for you. This kingdom of heaven, we start living that kind of life today. And so that's the challenge that I want to leave with you this morning. Would you stand and sing these words together?